Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. Parker Gallant writes frequent commentaries on how Canadians are being stripped of their wealth by various forms of climate charities. And here's another one of his writings that he gave me permission to read to you. The Canadian Climate Institute has now morphed into a charity. Huh? The CCI was originally called the Canadian Institute for Clean Growth and Climate Change, or the CICGCC, when originally created by Catherine McKenna as the Federal Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. The announcement was made as an outgrowth of a reputed competition, and McKenna handed the winning bidder the Pan-Canadian Expert Collaboration a group headed by Kathy Bardswick, former president and CEO of the Cooperators Group Limited, 20 million of our tax dollars. That 20 million was for the anticipated five-year process of using their expertise as a source of clean growth solutions for Canada and the world and can help all of us mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change. The original name suggested whatever was to come from this new taxpayer-funded organization produced by their expertise was a foregone conclusion. So the name was changed to the Canadian Institute for Climate Change, or CICC. Needless to say, the pan-Canadian collaboration was full of the usual gang of ENGO, charitable foundations, and included government entities as an earlier article disclosed when CCI was called the Canadian Institute for Climate Change, or CICC. It's now called the Canadian Climate Institute, and they have, presumably with the blessing of the CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency, converted this government-created organization to a charity. Tax-subsidized charity, of course. One should wonder why they became a charity as they were a not-for-profit institution, annually receiving the $4 million to display their expertise via those unbiased reports, sarcasm intended, promised by former Minister McKenna. It appears the annual four million of our tax dollars wasn't enough, as displayed on page two of their annual impact report for 2022-23. It states the Canadian Climate Institute is a nonpartisan, pan-Canadian charitable organization. Our work is made possible through the financial support of Environment and Climate Change Canada and the generous support of the Ivy Foundation, Scotiabank, Loblaw Companies Limited, Quad Real Property Group, and the Trottier Family Foundation. As an aside, a review of the above only disclosed one contribution of $20,000 dollars from the Trottier Foundation via the CRA filings, whereas the Ivy Foundation failed to provide their donee list to the CRA. One shouldn't wonder why the CRA doesn't enforce its regulations. The CRA filing for CCI provides salary ranges for the top 10 employees, and the top earner, who presumably is the current CEO, Rick Smith, earns somewhere between $200,000 to $249,999. <laughs> no energy poverty for him. Back on January 3rd, 2022, Rick Smith had an article published in McLean's titled, Let's Make Climate Change Boring in 2022. And in it was the following paragraph. The UK, for instance, has halved carbon emissions since 1990. It has settled into an annual cycle of executing the National Carbon Reduction Plan, assessing progress against the plan, updating the plan, then repeating. It's boring. It's predictable. It's working. So he says, interestingly enough, Mr. Smith failed to even consider how reducing emissions would drive up home energy costs, and they did, adding over 2 million more households in 222. As the following quote from an article in The Guardian on February 28, 2023 notes, the number of households in England who spend more than 10% of their income, excluding household costs on energy, has increased from 4.93 million households in 2021 to 7.39 million in 2022. He seems determined to do the same thing to Canadian households. At his taxpayer 
funded salary. However, it's unlikely he will experience energy poverty. So he presses on to increase energy poverty for the rest of the population. Now, looking at this charity, it's interesting to note the financial information filed with the CRA for the year ending March 31st, 2022, indicates charitable donations represented 0.2% or two-tenths of 1% of their gross revenue, strongly suggesting logical individuals fail to recognize them as a charity. Now, having a look at government grants, we should note that CCI, back in December 5th, 2022, were handed a $500,000 grant from the federal government described as policy analysis and stakeholder views on climate and environment impacts of inactive oil and gas wells. Apparently, the $4 million per year handed to the CCI is insufficient so they must gobble up another $500,000 of our tax dollars. Looking further at the CCI annual impact report for 2022-23, it's interesting to read the message from the president, Rick Smith, as he notes, in March 2023, the Federal Sustainable Finance Action Council published the Taxonomy Roadmap Report our experts contributed this inaugural taxonomy proposal, which starts to define what green and transition investing could look like in Canada, helping drive crucial private investments into activities that reduce emissions. The Smith message went on to say in July 2022, the Climate Institute hosted our first roundtable showcasing Indigenous-led research and policy on climate change. And in October, we teamed up with the Net Zero Advisory Body to co-host our first in-person national conference, Sustainable Finance Action Council. For those who are not familiar with the Sustainable Finance Action Council, it's another organization created by the Trudeau-led government on May the 12th, 2021, under Finance Minister Freeland and Jonathan Wilkinson, then Minister of Environment and Climate Change. They appointed Kathy Bardswick, former chair of the CICC, before its name changed to CCI, as the inaugural chair. And the press release stated, sustainable finance is about incorporating environmental, social, and governance factors into investment decisions and is a fast-growing market that's gaining speed as more and more businesses address climate change and transition to a low-carbon economy and seize the economic opportunities it presents. The council was basically charged with aligning ESG within the controls of the many companies operating in the confines of finance, including banks, insurance companies, and pension funds. Needless to say, in the time that followed, they had numerous meetings, plenary sessions, etc., with various parties within the financial sector, but none of the meetings, etc., appeared to be with sectors that manufacture products or distribute them grow food and sell or serve it, those who supply energy and those who would be most affected by applying ESG standards to their businesses. One should wonder why their views were not sought. The Net Zero Advisory Board, this may be another unfamiliar named organization by the Trudeau-led government announced on February 25th, 2021 by Jonathan Wilkinson, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change at the time. And he met with the newly appointed co-chairs, Marie-Pierre Ippersil and Dan Wicklum. The latter is CEO of the Transition Accelerator, one of the many charities founded by Bruce Laurie, where he sits as the chair. In a look at the CRA charity files for the Transition Accelerator, it discloses they have never had a donation where they have been required to issue a tax receipt. They have been quite successful at obtaining government grants, however, of at least $1.8 million. And turning now to the Net Zero Advisory Board, or NZAB, we should note in January 2023, they delivered their first annual report, the co-chair's message to Minister Gilbo about his emission reduction plan had this to say, the measures proposed in the 2030 emissions reduction plan, ERP, set credible foundations upon which 
more ambitious transition can be built. While we are confident our advice will help put Canada on the right path, bringing the full suite of ERP measures and proposals to fruition as quickly and rigorously as possible is required for success. They said the foregoing, despite the scary part of his original message, which claimed climate change is a crisis that persists and will only grow if we do not do more. Faster. Flooding, landslides, drought and wildfire, the mounting costs of extreme weather underscore the need to chart towards a future where Canadians have both a clean environment and a strong economy. Well, it's amusing and mind-blowing to scan the 75 pages of the NZAB's annual report and to visualize the destruction that will be caused to Canada's economy via the 25 pieces of advice the report recommends in support of Gilbo's ERP. The issue related to costs of each piece of advice are not examined or commented on, and only one reference to annual costs can be found. If one searches using the dollar sign, only nine can be found. If one searches using net zero, however, it generates 464 hits and emissions brings 171. We should have no doubt this is what was anticipated. In respect to costs, the report doesn't analyze any of their advice and quotes other reports with only one in respect to the total annual costs, which seems low. For example, one study shows that a pan-Canadian energy transition in all sectors would cost up to $43.3 billion annually until reaching net zero. That would represent about 1.6% of Canada's annual GDP. 2022 estimates, and approximately 22.7% of the 2023 annual budget. One should wonder where those billions will come from, as we're already running significant annual budget deficits. In other news about the NZAP, they seem excited, as some of them have attended the COP26 conference in Glasgow, and while there, NZAP, the CICC, now the CCI, and the Ivy Foundation, Bruce Laurie is the CEO, co-hosted an informal gathering with guests from the Canadian delegation and the ICCN. The two co-chairs posed pictures on their site with Trudeau, Gilbo, and Wilkinson, but it's hard to judge their excitement as they all have their masks on. We should be pretty sure the above attendees at COP26 in Glasgow were there thanks to the generosity of Canada's taxpayers, along with the other 270 Canadian delegates that were in attendance. It seems readily apparent the Trudeau-led government, who will spend over $34 billion annually to service our national debt, have no problem at spending another $43.3 billion annually to achieve the net zero targets, even though it will have no effect on global warming. It brings to mind our PM's quote, ah yes, you'll forgive me if I don't think about monetary policy. I don't know, when I think about the biggest, most important economic policy this government, if re-elected, would move forward, you'll forgive me if I don't think about monetary policy. Well, then, could you, Prime Minister Trudeau, at least stop granting charitable status to institutions your government creates and stop throwing our tax dollars to them via grants? For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling, and I'm really mad. <laughs>